You are now listening to the station that's keeping it real. WBOK 1230 AM, where it's real talk for real times. Welcome back, y'all. This is Showtime in the Afternoon. Paul Boyer and John Slade, WBOK, 1230 a.m. on your dial. We got half of the usual suspects in the studio today. Janae Pierre's on the big board. Kevin's going home. I guess and get some (laughs) R&R. Kevin's doing the morning show, which means he has to be here early in the morning. All righty, as we move along with Showtime in the Afternoon, we have a guest today who I think is very interesting and, and involved in uh, a very interesting professional life, and that is Dr. Kevin Jordan, um, who is President and Chief Operating Officer of Townsend, which is a network of Outpatient Addiction Treatment Centers. Welcome, Dr. Jordan. Good to have you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. What is the doctor thing about? Is that a medical doctor, PhD? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm an MD, trained okay. here in, uh, at LSU in New Orleans. Yes. Okay, good. How did you get into the addiction business? Well, it's interesting because uh, my background and training is in emergency medicine. So okay. I, I did the whole thing uh training in how to take care of folks who present uh, with the uh, unfortunately all too common trauma and the medical diseases that we see both here in New Orleans statewide and nationally. But I got uh, involved in the addiction sphere uh, because the one of my partners and a co-founder of the uh, of Townsend uh, and I have been friends through medical school. So th- that was one draw. The o- the other draw was the fact that um, you know as as an emergency medicine physician uh, and an emergency department director, I would see all the time uh, patients that would come in and simply because uh, an individual had a problem with uh, substance abuse or addiction or a mental health ailment or what have you, um, there's a, there would be a tendency uh, for them to be for them to be uh, relegated into mm-hmm. sort of a second class citizen category, mm-hmm. and that frankly really pissed me off. Mm-hmm. It really teed me off because you know I, I was uh, fond of saying that those okay. folks really had medical problems too. That sparred my my passion with this. So when I had an opportunity to get into it from an administrative standpoint and a clinical standpoint, I jumped at the, at the chance. Have you uh, dispensed with the emergency medical practice as, as, as such? Yeah, yes, I have for okay. the most part. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's funny. A mentor of mine told me that uh, the second you become board certified in emergency medicine is the second you start looking for a way out because <laughs> of the <laughs> because of the pressures and the yeah, the, yeah. the the burnout factor. So uh, I did some administrative work with a, a network here in town, and then decided to to do this. You know, you you you, you mentioned something um, earlier that I think really needs to be addressed early in this conversation, and and and, and that is, people who suffer with an addiction are relegated, perhaps, to second class citizenship, maybe third or fourth class, uh, yes. anything less than human. And those of us who are not do not understand that. Addiction is is a disease. Like I mean, it's a disease. Yes. It's not a, a character for something that people come up and say, "I want to be an addict," or uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, how do you de- how do you how, explain that to us? Sure, it, you know that because that, that's I think the hub of this conversation. Yeah, yeah, it really is. You know, you know there was a for those of us who are old enough. We remember the famous Nancy Reagan um, phrase about the drug war, just say no, as though there was a choice to use or not use. 
Now, now make no mistake, I'm, I'm not saying that people aren't accountable for their actions. In mm-hmm. fact, quite the contrary. Uh, I'm, that's precisely what I'm saying. But it's interesting. We don't treat any other biological disease like we treat the biological disease of addiction. If I were to tell a, a diabetic, for example, well, yes, you have diabetes, but you know what? What you really need to do is just say no and go to some groups and you'll do fine. No, we recognize that diabetes is caused by a certain problem in the pancreas. The pancreas does not produce a protein, a substance known as insulin. And as a result of that, there are certain metabolic physiologic uh, problems. The same thing with addiction. Addiction is a primary function, or I should say malfunction, of the brain. It's the, it's the way the brain is wired and certain cell types in the brain, in a particular part of the brain, that are do not function normally. And it's that lack of normal functioning that contributes to and causes the behaviors, what we call the primary signs of addiction, restlessness, irritability, and discontent. And those things cause the behaviors. We... To, to, to date in this country, we have got the cart pulling the horse. We've said that the behaviors or the use of a substance mm. is what causes the addiction. As my dad used to say, that's bass backwards. Mm. It's having the underlying problem that causes the behaviors. Now, when you get into the the concept of <clears throat> when you get into the concept of of well, you know, why do people behave that way? Remember, behavior is a symptom of the underlying physiology of the brain. So if you've got a brain that's not wired correctly, that's not producing this this neurotransmitter that we call dopamine that gives you this sense of well-being, if that's not normal, then the behaviors happen. It's not a question of choice. Mm. Some people can go, and if you read enough about the, in this area, you come across... Uh, observations like I'm about to make. Some people can go into a bar and have a glass of wine and yes. and leave. Yes. Uh, other people cannot. They got to have 16 glasses of wine or 26 glasses of wine. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it doesn't stop. So, again, that is not a choice thing. That's correct. It's not. Think of it in these terms. If you um, if you miss a meal or two, you you get you become a bit hungry. Mm-hmm. But if I then said to you, let's say you missed lunch and now it's dinner time, and I put a week's worth of groceries on the other side of I ten, and I tell you, you know, you could have that week of groceries. All you got to do is cross all six lanes of I ten. You're going to think twice about doing that because you got to navigate that traffic coming at you. Mm-hmm. Now let's say that you haven't eaten in a week. And I put a week's worth of groceries and meals across 610 or I-10. You're going, you're much more likely to take that risk because it's about survival. Okay? The patient that has the primary biological disease of addiction is a person who doesn't know what it feels like to be quote unquote normal. Their sense of, of well being, their sense of, 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 of understanding what it means and what's wonderful about seeing a sunset, for example. They lack that. So because they lack that and they take the substance, whatever that is, whether that's an opiate, whether it's alcohol, whether it's excessive sex or sex uh, uh, promiscuity, whether whether it's gambling, whatever, whatever, that primary reward mechanism is what makes them feel for the first time what we would describe as normal. Mm. So if, if I now told you, you know what, just say no to feeling normal. There's no way you're not going to do it, right? John? Very compelling. I have a question to ask that's on a nuts and bolts fashion. Um, you're a private company. Yes. That means you got to make a profit, correct? That's true. Okay. You help people with addictions. Yes. I come to you and I have nothing. I have mm-hmm. destroyed myself with drugs. I'm on my last legs. Death is the next stop. Mm-hmm. House gone, job gone, savings gone. I'm sure. destitute and sure. I smell awful. Mm-hmm. You going to take me in? Likely, yes. Okay. And, you know, we spend up, we recognize this company was, was, was founded on a principle that this for many, many people is the last shot. 
Okay? Mm-hmm. The first time, the, you know, patients that come to us, this is not their first go round. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. and the company was founded to be able to treat the underlying cause, the underlying problem, and then to give people that last shot. We spend a lot of resources. Um, to be able to care for those folks who don't have the necessary resources. Now, like anything, as you pointed out, we are a business, and we have to survive, um, and we have to be able to take care of and uh, folks, so we have to generate some revenue in order to be able to care for people. But we spend a lot of that reinvesting in back into the company so that we can actually make our presence felt, and, and a way of doing that is to provide for some folks who don't have the funds in order to take care of themselves. Do you think that normal, quote unquote, normal people <laughs> uh, understand addiction? I mean, uh, you know, and I, I say that because you hear the terminology. You know, that's a crackhead. Mm-hmm. That's a strawberry. Or that's a that's something other than a human being. Yeah. And those phrases come from quote unquote normal people. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if normal people understand, the, the, the uh, you know, addiction, and, and do they understand that they, they wouldn't look at uh, somebody standing in the street uh, dying of cancer of the liver mm-hmm. and say, look at that cancer liver fiend mm-hmm. dying in front of me. You wouldn't say that. Right. Well, the short answer to your question is no, folks don't understand it because because the, the history of how addiction is taken care of and how it's managed back to the early the early aspects of the of the treatment for the disease back in the late 30s and early 40s has always classified it as somehow a defective character that it's somehow a choice that you know what the fact that you put that second third fourth cocktail to your lips and drink it that's your choice to do that so so no folks that that pervades our society um, and our and folks view folks don't understand that addiction is tantamount to just like diabetes just like heart disease just like hi- primary hypothyroidism there's a problem there's a physiologic problem with a part of the body and that causes a, another s- sign symptom or, or, or uh, uh, a problem uh, uh, I, I, I just as you being in that, I guess medical profession for want of a better term, because that is part of the medical it is. thing. Um, how does it start? How does an addiction start? Okay, you take that first tope, you take that first snort. Okay, mm-hmm. it's great. You want to do it again, but people can also say, as you say, with the the sugars, you right. took that first Hershey bar. Right. You know. And it's a disease. Now, when we think of disease, I would imagine you're able to prove that on paper with peer-reviewed articles that it is like a disease. It affects the human body negatively. Your brain has been turned. Your chemistry has been turned to wit. Your body now craves this, and uh, you are in a disease state. That can be absolutely shown to people, and I'm because I say that because you still have the debate of what what do you mean. So how does it start, and can you prove on paper it's really a disease? How does it start? It doesn't start. That's part of the misconception. You're born with it. It's the way your brain is wired. Okay. We can show that in the disease of addiction, and you mentioned peer review articles, etc., and I'm glad you brought it up because there's an entire section of research uh, devoted, uh, devoted specifically to this. We know that in the section of the brain that there are certain cell types, okay, um, the ventral tegmental area of the brain, for example, that, that controls and gives output towards what's known as the nucleus accumbens. We can actually tell you that, there, that that particular circuit in the brain and how it connects with the frontal lobe and how it gives out, uh, out certain other neurotransmitters, that the, the concentration of those neurotransmitters, what we call dopamine tone, is significantly reduced in the patient with addiction versus the quote-unquote normal brain. This is not like a disease. This is a disease. And it's that misconception, I, 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 I say to you humbly, is the primary, that's the crux of the matter. Until folks understand that it's a primary problem, 
It's a structural problem. It's a neurochemical problem. Just like in, in diabetes, it's a problem of the of the islet cells, the beta cells in your in the pancreas of the brain of the in your pancreas that don't produce insulin. That's the same uh, like problem in the brain. And until that's fully recognized and accepted, then we're going to have some of the issues that you just brought up. On the other hand, also, you know, we're talking about, again, quote, unquote, normal people, people who perhaps are not addicted, they are not addicts. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, as you said, uh, you know, that, that whole thing does not have to, is, not, is not just relegated to drugs. It mm-hmm. could be relegated to sex. It could be relegated to gambling. You name it. It's the primary re- reward source. Right. It's not the substance. Right. But on the other hand, I, you know, I actually do normal people understand that. Let's let's switch over to the addict. Mm-hmm. Does the addict understand that? That um, I, I can't, can't take this one drink. Uh, you know, I got a, I, I really got a sick. problem. I really got a problem. Yeah, I'm sick. Does the addict, even before he thinks he's an addict, does he understand? Say, Man, I might be sick. No, no. And that's what contributes. That's part of the the insidious nature of this. Because remember, what you just what you just referred to is a rational um, decision making process that the that the addict would have to make mm-hmm. in order to go through that. There are, there, and, and to analyze it, there are these bits of pieces of information, and therefore I'm going to come to a rational conclusion as a result of that. That's a function of a normally functioning brain. Mm-hmm. Now, what did I say was the pathophysiology here? The brain is broken, right? So if the brain is broken, the ability to come to, to, come to um, uh, rational conclusions – Okay, particularly when it comes to something that is is inherent in, uh, in that individual is broken as well. Mm-hmm. So, does the addict understand that he or she is sick? No, and that's part of the initial treatment to be able to stabilize the brain, increase the over the overall amount of dopamine tone, that neurotransmitter that contributes to the overall sense of well being and sense of purposefulness in one's life, increasing that. So now someone can, for the first time, say, "Well, wait a minute." Now that the brain is stabilized and working the way it should, maybe I do have a problem. Maybe there is an issue here. You say we're born with it. I'm confused. That means we're born potentially to be addicted to anything? See, there, we there, there you go again, being we addicted to something. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, when you say that, I don't understand. Sure. I'm born with a broken brain? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. That I find counterintuitive. Talk me into that. Well... Um, and let me let me say this: I don't think you can, because he's normal, <laughs> right? On, on I, real. I, I mean, on the for real, real I, I need to know. And I, I'm saying you can't know, but that's just me. Let me put it this way, okay? There's a there's a problem um, in, with a heart, something that's called atrial fibrillation, okay? Wow! <laughs> I hope I don't have that. <laughs> Well, it it's uh, it can be well, uh, it can be problematic too, and and it's it's actually uh, fairly prevalent in the African American community. Hmm. Um, but basically, one of the reasons that you have atrial fibrillation is that you're born with a heart that's broken. And what I mean by that is is that the normal heart has an electrical wiring system. Okay, that wiring system allows for the um, the um, electrical impulses to go through the heart at a certain pace, at a certain rate, uh, and a certain um, um, by certain means. People who have uh, a particular type of atrial fibrillation or a particular type of of rapid heartbeat are built with extra. Wi- they're born with extra wiring. That extra wiring is the way God put them together. And that contributes to this, the signs and symptoms of this problem. The same thing with um, addiction. You are born with this section of your brain that, that by nature, the way God puts you together, does not produce, just like the islet cells in the pancreas do not produce insulin, this section of your brain does not produce those neurotransmitters, that, and that the one specifically is dopamine. And because of natural that... Natural endorphins. No, natural dopamine is not a natural endorphin. Oh. Natural endorphin is, is a... Is a uh, you're talking about opiates, etc. Now, 
dopamine contributes to other sections of the brain, and the biochemistry there is pretty complex. Um, so I, I don't want to bore you with that, but I will say I'm fascinated. <laughs> anybody else? <laughs> uh, but but I will say that is that it's it's the fact that that those particular cells and that particular circuit in your brain does not work normally, does not produce at the normal level, does not give you this level of what we call dopamine tone, and because of that, that contributes to it is the problem. So uh, when I come quote addicted to drugs. That's my body trying to find a compensation. And when they, my body thinks it's found that, and I think I feel great, and thus my body is kind of confused and thinks this is great, give me more, and then it gets out of hand. Well, it, it, number one, you're destined for it to get out of hand because what it does is, and again, uh, you know, I use the sun, the sun rising and the, uh, being able to appreciate a sunset analogy or the, the food analogy. Um, but it, it's, it's, think of it in these terms. I'll try one more time. Um, you, you're at a big house, you're at a big antebellum home, and you're looking in the window, and there's a cocktail party going on. People are laughing and joking and having a good time. There's a general esprit de corps. People are feeling great. You can see that, um, that folks are having a good time, and it's a very festive atmosphere. The addict is the person, the person with the broken brain, is the person standing on the porch looking at that window, and they don't get it. Why is everybody having a good time? What's all this social interaction going with people? Okay, I don't understand. What, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? Everyone seems to be having a good time. I don't do that. I can't do that. Why can't I do that? What's wrong with me that I can't do that? Then I become angry and resentful. And then I happen upon something. Let's say it's an opiate, heroin, crack, alcohol, chocolate, gambling, whatever, and it makes me feel great. And I feel now that I can interact. And all of a sudden, while I'm doing that or taking that substance, that primary mechanism of uh, reward mechanism, I now can interact. I feel like, hey, I'm like them. Are you now just going to say no and not use it? Hmm. Let me, let me, I, I, I don't, you'll never That's, get it. Oh, just, I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's very good the way he's walking me through yeah, it. Yeah, it is. That's <laughs> one of the best explanations I've heard. Let, let me ask you this, doc, Dr. Kevin Jordan. Uh, I want to make sure we get that name out there. And Townsend is the name of, 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 of the, the company that uh, treats uh, uh, addicts. People who come to you. Are they brought in, uh, or, 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 or do they have some kind of awakening? And you know, they're listening to this. There are two things that are happening right now. Even as you are on the air, somebody is saying, "I'm, I'm gonna bring her to Townsend," mm -hmm. and somebody is saying, "Maybe I should go to Townsend." Which are you more likely to see? The person who makes a, a, a personal decision saying, I'm coming to see you, or the spouse, or the grandmother, or the brother, or the sister of somebody and saying, I'm going to bring him there. I'm going to bring her there. Maybe. It's the family member. It's the family member, the friend, the loved one, the female head of household that says, I'm going to try to get my, my, my loved one some help. We're coming right back. We're talking to Dr. Kevin Jordan. Owner, founder, uh, and chief operating officer of Townsend, a network of outpatient addiction treatment centers. We're coming right back, y'all. Hold tight. If someone asks what station you listen to, let them know you listen to The Community's Choice. WBOK, 1230 AM, New Orleans. It's real talk for real times. Alrighty, welcome back, y'all. This is Showtime in the Afternoon. Paul Boyer, John Slade, Dr. Michael White. <laughs> That's the kind of music Woody Allen likes to play. 
It's the kind of music you can't stay still to. Oh, no. It's, I it's, tell you, it's, it's New fun. Orleans music. Dr. Michael White. Um, Dr. White is a 72 graduate of St. Aug. When did you finish? I finished in 1977. Okay. Okay. Oh. Seven, Practically years. a youngster. Yeah. Still <laughs> well, with around you. the years. Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. And we're talking to Dr. Kevin Jordan, uh, founder and chief operating officer of Townsend. Mm-hmm. Townsend, a network of outpatient addiction treatment mm-hmm. centers. It's a fascinating discussion it about is. the intricacies of addiction. Yeah. 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 Well... You know, the, we left off when I asked you, how do you how, how, how do you get there for the most part? You know, the, it's been your experience where people just kind of like make a choice and say, I'm coming in to see you, or is someone bringing sure. them in? Right. And you you pointed out it's usually someone bringing you in. It's usually someone bringing, bring, bringing the individual in or at least calling us to say, hey, my son, my daughter, my grandmother, my aunt. And notice right. I, I crossed the entire age spectrum there. I didn't just say it was someone mm-hmm. younger or middle-aged. So, yeah, and, and you know, we're, we we uh, we take those calls and we help to work through with folks and to see how, um, if, in fact, they have the biological disease of addiction. And I, I say that in contradistinction to substance abuse. Those are two different things. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Well, explain that because I'm not. I, I didn't know that. Well, substance abuse is you. 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 you it's a recreational thing. For example, um, the uh, I'll I'll pick on a college student. The college student who is young and and they've, they've turned 21 and now they can drink. So they have one beer mm. and they have a second beer and they have a third beer and they pass out. Okay, and they're having quote unquote fun and partying. But that person doesn't have to have the fourth one, mm-hmm. the fifth one, right. the sixth one. Right. Okay, so there's a big difference. There's a two completely different animals abusing substances because of behavior mm-hmm. versus a biological disease that manifests its 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 underlying pathology by certain behaviors. It's completely different. Where wow. do you start the treatment? You know, okay, somebody brings a person in and not in. What, what's, well, where do you start? The, the first thing is is to do an assessment, okay, to be able to determine does this person actually have that biological disease. And there are certain things that we do. Um, we can test uh, the individual neurocognitively. We do a whole entire psychosocial evaluation, something we call a part one and part two assessment. Um, and then we do a series of neurocognitive testing that actually tests risk over reward, for example. How... What's what's one's one's um, capacity for being able to sustain risk versus reward? And we know that certain patterns of that, for example, point towards addiction as opposed to non. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, you know the the patient with the biological disease of addiction, they they're they're going to go for the reward every time, as opposed to backing off and waiting and, and judging the risk. They're going to make impetuous decisions as opposed to standing back and weighing things cognitively. Why? Because the brain is broken, right? So they're going to go for the reward every single time. Is that what they call triggers? I mean, something can trigger you? To, well, to, to, to not that necessarily. I mean, there are triggers that can, yeah. can and, and, you know, you've, the, there are all kinds of stories. People have, have come across things that can actually trigger them and, and spur that little voice, for example, to say certain things to them. Uh, inside, but no. What I'm talking about is is the propensity for certain behaviors mm-hmm. as a result of the underlying problem. I've heard the first step is, and this could be in the in, in part of the treatment. I don't, I don't know how much how much a part of the treatment of the, of the 12 steps. Mm-hmm. Um, but from what I know, that first step. That's a monster. Mm-hmm. That's 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 the one where you. I think you say I I, I got a problem. It's it's the first it's the first cognition and it's it, it's the same thing in our program, mm. um, but helping someone to realize with a broken brain that they have a problem, you've got to you got to do something to help the broken brain first mm. to be able to get to that reality. It's it's uh, it's it's interesting that you know if if you're restless, if you're irritable, if you're malcontent, if you're mad at the world, it's kind of hard to start to look at yourself um, introspectively, calmly. And objectively, it's to say, yes, I do have a problem, and I, I can't do this on my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, but couldn't you be those things, excuse me, mm-hmm. without being an addict? I mean, couldn't you be restless, malcontent, and 
whatever, you know, bad attitude about without being an addict? I mean, that... Well, those are primary behavioral issues. Yeah, you can certainly be that. Be that, but those are the those are that constellation or that triad of of mm-hmm. symptoms, for example, along with this assessment, is what helps us to to point us in the direction of of the biological disease. Uh, break down the astonishing, I guess, in the past twenty years, uh, Marion Barry, mayor of. Mm-hmm. Uh, Washington, D.C., got caught with the crack in the hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody in the news, in a story I read, probably in the Washington Post or the Washington Post Weekly, I'm shocked. He's a crack addict, but he's mayor. How come <laughs> he's not falling down in the gutter and acting crazy? Tell us about the functional addict, the guy you just wouldn't think about, but he is, but he can still show up for work and do things. How are they different? than the ones that fly apart and show up immediately at your place. Well, remember, um, diseases have vari- have variations and they have variances, right? You, for example, and I, I keep going back to diabetes because everyone, uh, not everyone. Everybody but, got it. <laughs> in the black community, it's, it's a discussion point. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, well, you went there. I didn't. That's okay. I'll go, I'll just go with the program. Um uh, but, but you know there there's the you know there's type one diabetes type mm-hmm. two diabetes you know insulin requiring insulin dependent etc those are those are variations on that theme right, right. Mm-hmm. same thing with the biologic disease and you notice I keep saying the biologic mm-hmm. disease mm-hmm. of addiction mm-hmm. um, uh, w- uh, because they're variations and their folks some folks learn how to compensate very very well through other coping mechanisms okay there's a story of 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 the person who, for example, can go out and party all night, drink, party, drugs, whatever, and then come home and take a shower, have a cup of coffee, and go to work the next day and function. But eventually, eventually, as any disease runs its course, your ability to cope and you'll be able to function at that level, because that's your burning... You know, what your grandma used to say, right? Burning both candles at uh, at both both ends. ends. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you're doing. And eventually, that fuel, that candle, burns out. So it's it's about gradation and scale. Let let, let me talk about a particular substance, and that is crack cocaine. Yes. Uh, And 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 and, you know, you've been talking about the brain, the broken brain, etc. And I've I've heard read talked about in conversation that this particular drug does re- really does something to the brain that perhaps marijuana doesn't do even heroin doesn't do that this is this may be one of the one of the most if not the most destructive uh, drug that an addict could con- uh, experience mm-hmm, mm-hmm. am I on track with that or what well, again, with the underlying, the, the given is that, you know, everybody reacts differently to, to whatever the substance may be. But again, the, the, the potency or the effect that a drug have, has well, when taken under, when someone has the biological disease of addiction is related to the over, what it does to that dopamine level in the brain. You know, for the normal quote unquote person who the unbroken brain, the, your your brain produces a certain amount of dopamine and keeps it pretty level throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, certain substances, depending upon you know the crack cocaine, for example, is one where you take it and you get this big, all of a sudden, rapid spike. Boom! The dopamine level goes to the to the roof. So you're feeling whoa. It's almost like somebody tattooed an S on your chest, gave you a red cape, and you're flying around the world, right, like Mm, Superman. mm. But then very quickly, that dopamine level crashes, okay? So now you go from the highest high to the lowest low in a relatively short period of time. So now if you've just experienced that high, Mm -hmm. right, and now it crashes real quickly, what are you going to do? Try to get that again. You're going to get that again, right? Mm -hmm. Boom. More coke. Boom! Same thing, right? Mm. So the destructive nature comes from the potency of it and that those spikes of dopamine. And different substances with different brains give you different spikes over periods of time. And that's the compelling nature of the of the continued and increasing use. Mm. Gambling, <clears throat> sitting down playing poker all night. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. The slot machine. Oh. Mm-hmm. Now that's fascinating because you're not putting anything in your yeah, body. You're, you're not, sitting you're, there yeah. and you're just working the you're, machine. Nothing's going in. Same kind of dopamine thing. Absolutely, yeah. same thing. Because it's remember, I referred to it as a primary system of reward, right? What gives you that feeling of reward and gratification? It doesn't necessarily have to be a substance. It can be an act. Mm, okay, and I think people need to say that. And I think you need to say that again. Right. It's That's, it's about it's about pre, you know it's not wow. just the drug. It's yeah. it's behaviors that give you that sense of gratification. Let's talk about the, your centers. Uh, uh, where are they, and what can people do to get into them? Do you take insurance? You know, I thought John brought up a good point because sure. most addicts, I would think, I mean, people who really need problems, who really need help, your help. That's how they come into you. Mm-hmm. You'd be surprised, though. We our, our, our you get some people like me. I mean, we get so people just... like you. We get people um, like me. We get doctors, lawyers, Indian, uh, Indian chiefs, politicians, wow. the whole ball game. Okay, yeah. um, we, we have currently um, five centers. A sixth one that's about to open in uh, in Homa very 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 soon. Um, at New Orleans and New Orleans, Metairie, Covington, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and soon to be Homa. And uh, if anyone's interested in contacting with us and talking about uh, the very nature of uh, of addiction and uh, maybe wanting to refer a family member, etc., they can call our 24-hour addiction hotline. That number is 504-230-0898. Again, 504-230-0898. And for anyone who might be interested in reading about this, Paul, we have we have a book that we call QA. It's questions and answers on addiction. Um, one of my partners um, and the, the chief medical officer of the company, Dr. Howard Wetzman, wrote this, and it's it's called Questions and Answers on Addiction. On addiction, it's a very easy read, big print for those of us who are getting along in age. It comes, you know, it's nice to be able to see big print. Uh, last question: We're close to a magic bullet. Take a pill, walk out fine, no treatment, no problems. No. Dag nabbit. Okay. Sound like you on a joint, John. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I said that. <laughs> Dr. Kevin John, thank you so much for being with us. Thank right? you I very really much, appreciate Paul. It. I appreciate um, it. You have an open door here because, I mean, what you say is uh, a lot of people need to hear. All right, we're coming right back, y'all. This is Showtime in the Afternoon. We got a familiar guy with us today. Hold tight. <laughs> 